everyone, welcome back to the channel and to our latest video. In the county of Suffolk stands an unusual yet complete keep at Orford Castle, in the quiet coastal village of Orford. Back in the 12th century, this town was busy and lively, being by a busy port, and it was second only to Ipswich as an important trading centre for Suffolk. The castle, though, is a striking medieval castle that was once used to emphasise its royal authority within the area. Amazingly, this keep is in fantastic condition, following on some restoration works recently done. But although rather empty inside, it provides a great look into the parts of medieval Britain and how people once lived. So join us as we wander Orford Castle. You may wonder how the castle gets that iconic yellow tint. Well, it's made from local cement stone called Septaria, alongside Barnack stone, which is a fossil-rich Northamptonshire limestone. Some cairn stone was imported from Normandy and used for the finer carved architectural detail, alongside a hardened shelly sand that was used inside the castle. I love how this castle looks on the approach to it, and especially from the air too which if you stick around, you'll see exactly what I mean. The first building that we make our way up into is the chapel, the most beautifully decorated room in the whole of the castle. It was well lit with stunning glass windows to let the light shine in, and the walls have wonderful arcading, some semicircular arches that were supported by columns, and there is quite little of stone carving elsewhere in the castle, but this chapel had stunning carvings, just again showing how important God was to the families and also how much they respected religion. The castle was originally built under the strict orders of King Henry II and although the surrounds don't survive today, it was an impressively sized stone structure that was fortified and surrounded by a curtain wall and several defensive and clever mounds. When Henry acquired the throne in 1154, there was not a single royal castle in all of Suffolk. This was a very bad idea, as it meant the king had very little presence in the county, and most importantly, he needed to be strong and intimidating, and have a presence to counter the power of the Earl of Norfolk, Hugh Bagod, and the location and the castle itself made perfect sense to root its home here in Orford. Modern day Orford Castle is now a unique polygonal tower and it has three square turrets and is 90 foot high. This castle is famous and unique for its fact that it's the earliest British castle for which records of its constructions actually exist. This was down to some of the royal pipe rolls that were found here. The pipe rolls are a series of English public records for finance and administrative history. They would contain the royal income, breaking down each financial year. The name pipe rolls would have more than likely come about because of the sheepskin rolls that they once used. Once stored in the presses, it would have resembled a stack of pipes. But Henry's pipe rolls showed that the total cost of the building of Orford Castle was £1,413, which at the time was an extortionate amount of cash to part with. But the expense was worth every penny. For Henry, Orford was not just a fortress or a stronghold, it was a symbol of his power and his status. The next room that we enter was the upper hall, perhaps my favourite room of the castle, mainly because of its huge round table and its tall walls. I sat down and thought about how this room would have looked back in its day. The table would have been stacked high with wine goblets full of freshly pressed wine, food for days and feasts till their bellies would pop, and the tapestries running down each of the walls. And the hall would have also been full of people shouting, showing off, laughing and enjoying themselves. I had read that throughout the feast they would hire brightly dressed jugglers to amuse them throughout as well as a fool to keep them laughing. The hall now contains a great exhibition, showing off a collection of objects found throughout Orford's life. Some of the items include a hoard of axes from the Bronze Age, maps, 
various pictures, family photographs, coins, fragments of armour and clothing. It's very interesting to take the time to see what they have to showcase and just what they were able to salvage. The castle remained in royal hands right up until 1336, when it was sold by King Edward III, and it began to decay over time, with the curtain wall completely collapsing and the stone from it stolen and lost. Yet the tall keep that we climb today survived because it was a very useful landmark for shipping. Later in the 19th century, the castle was adored by many for its rightfully so picturesque qualities and it was a beautiful, lavish summer home for the owners of the Sudbourne estate. It was Sir Richard Wallace in 1871 who furnished the upper hall. After Sir Wallace, the castle went through seven more private owners who enjoyed the castle before transferring the castle to the care of the English heritage. One story that I had heard about Orford was a tale about the wild man of Orford, a legend and a mysterious man who was caught in the nets of the local fishermen and around 1167. They had thought they had caught a big catch and were dreaming about the feasts that they would be able to deliver and the money they would receive, only to be confused and shocked at a naked wild man, covered in hair and someone who had obviously lived in the sea for some time. The wild man was also rightfully confused. He was brought back to the castle where he was thrown into a dungeon and held for six months whilst being tortured and interrogated constantly. He said absolutely nothing, grunted his responses and behaved in a feral way throughout. On a rare occasion, the fisherman took the wild man back to the sea to give him some time for fresh air as they had felt sorry for him and his constant torture so they put him in a pen of nets to see if he would enjoy being back in the water, but stupidly they forgot to put a bottom in the pen, and the wild man swam free and returned to the sea, where he was never seen again. I love reading and listening to the stories and the tales from the past. It's so interesting, because we will never know what really is fact and what is fiction, but it's always fun to believe. we climb the stairs again, this time to the roof of the keep, and discover inside of the castle's bakery. It's said that the bread was served with every single meal, with white bread for the social elite, and brown bread for everybody else. Inside here, we can see the remains of a bread oven, lined with floor and roof tiles. 
This was because the tiles were considered not good enough to use elsewhere in the castle, so they put them inside the oven instead. The tiles are among the earliest examples of their kind in England, not only reaching the top of the keep that you get to see the inside of the small bakery, but you also get the chance to have a look over at the landscape of the place, and you can really see why Henry wanted this, and also the various vantage points that you would have had from up here. On a day like today, a visit here is perfect, it was everything we wanted to experience, and more. Prince Edward would often visit Orford and would typically arrive unannounced, or at the very least with short notice, so there would be chaotic and frantic panic at the castle, as the servants would rush around to prepare for a royal visit, where they would make sure that they clean every inch and make sure that there was an abundance of food and drink ready on arrival. When the king or the owners would have been elsewhere, maybe on business, a constable would have been in charge of the castle. One particular constable was notorious for being a nasty piece of work and misusing his powers. He once threw a royal official in prison at the castle, and it's suspected that the dungeon that we take a peek into, underneath the entrance, was the place that the royal official was badly beaten. The constable also abused another man, so horrifically that he died of his injuries. There's a small car park just down by the entrance of the tower, and most importantly, it's free. Entrance into Orford will set you back £8.50 for adults and £4.50 for children, or free if you're part of the English Heritage membership. The surrounding area of the castle is also a great walk around. You can easily bring a picnic and spend a good few hours exploring here. We've enjoyed our visit and hope that you have too, through our lens. If you did, please hit that like button, consider joining us as a member of the channel, or on our Patreon, all links are below. And if you're feeling awesome, please consider subscribing to the channel. We want to say a big thank you to our recent members and our Patreons for all of their support, in helping us carrying on doing what we love showing you. We'll see you in the next one, till next time.